away from his family and away from his land. And he makes him an incredible promise because Abraham had faith. And he tells him that he's going to make him the father of many nations. And he tells them that he's going to take them into a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a promise that he gives him. It's a promise that Abraham never sees with his carnal eyes. But he had faith to believe that that promise would come to pass. And so God foretells that Israel will go into a foreign land. And that there in that land that they would be in bondage. And that they would be in bondage for some 400 years before they would be delivered. And that in the fourth generation that they would be delivered. And that they would step foot in that promised land. And so we move on to Exodus. And we find that the descendants of Abraham have come and that they are occupying the foreign land of Egypt. If I will, uh, remember right, I believe there were some 75 of them that came over of Joseph's family, uh, of the uh, children of Israel that began to occupy Egypt. Sometime later, a new king comes along and we're familiar with the story and, and, and the Israelites aren't in great favor with this king. In fact, he's challenged by the fact that they're there. He says their numbers are many and their strength is great and I fear that if they was to ever team up with another military, we'd be in, good, we'd be in trouble. And so we need to put them under bondage. We've got to make sure that they don't rise up against us. And so the Bible says that taskmasters was put over the children of Israel. And it says that they was put under hard labor. It wasn't no easy labor. It says that their life became quite bitter. It says they were made bitter with hard bondage. That they were placed under rigorous labor. And for 400 years, they faced rigor. And for 400 years, they faced hard bondage. And for 400 years, day after day after day, bent over, with sweat rolling down, they were abused and they were beaten and they were tormented and they were forced to do the work of the Egyptians. 400 years is a long time. 400 years is, is older than our country. 400 years, I believe, crush hopes. 400 years would crush dreams. And, and 400 years, I believe, would develop a strong slavery mentality. I've been working in a factory for about three months now. It feels like 400 years. <laughs> it's not what I was cut out for, Brother Adam, but I'm there. And I can't imagine what I would feel like if I had 400 years of that place. Or what my descendants would feel. I hope that they would own it after 400 years. But that wasn't the case here. Many prisoners today actually dread their release date because they don't know how they're going to make it on their own. They don't know how they're going to survive they don't know whether or not they'll be able to provide for themselves. They're not sure if they'll be accepted. They're not sure if they'll carry the brand of their sin on out into society, that they will be judged. They're fearful of change, even though they desperately want. Many of them, once they find their freedom, find themselves only to go out and to commit sins and commit uh, crimes in order to go back to that place where they didn't have to be concerned, where they didn't have to take on the responsibilities of life, where they didn't have to be obedient to the law, where someone could tell them what to do and when to do, and they preferred that lifestyle, even though it was a miserable lifestyle for them. But such was not the case for the children of Israel, because they cried out to God to deliver them. And he heard their cry, and he remembered his covenant, and he set into motion the plan for their deliverance. Amen? I think it's fitting to, to, to look back upon the deliverance of God's people in a time that we celebrate freedom, in a time that we celebrate liberty, because this is what they wanted most of all, was to have their freedom. Right. Moses is born. His life is spared. His 
mother was able to nurse him up and bring him up before Pharaoh's house. And I think that it's worthy of mentioning that she was able to still mourn him in a few years than the Pharaoh's house could take out in the next 30 something. Because one day, there must have been something that rose up inside of him when he saw his brother being abused and mistreated that caused him to want to take matters into his own hands. And I would imagine that being raised in a Pharaoh's house, he had a little different mentality than what the slaves had. I imagine that he, he, he had seen the Pharaohs take what they wanted. That he had watched them do as they pleased. And so he seen this injustice and he took matters into his own hands only to find that the people would not follow him. And when he come back and he tried to settle an argument between them and said, what are you going to do? Kill us like you did that other guy? And word got out and he got scared and ran. A lot of times we look at the children of Israel and we say, I don't understand how they could wander around out there 40 years in the desert. And yet, and a lot of times I've heard it said that it took 40 years for God to take Egypt out of the people. But prior to that, it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Moses. Before he was able to go in to lead the people out by God's hand. First he had to learn to submit to God. First he had to learn meekness and he must have learned that lesson well because later on in the Bible it says that Moses was one of the meekest men on the planet. So he must have learned that lesson well before he came back to Egypt. But today, I'm not here to preach just about Moses. Today I hope that I can get across a simple message. We have to build an altar that is unforgettable. We've got to build a monument, an altar to God that we can see, that our families can see, that our friends can see, and that generations to come can see. Something that they will look at and say, hey, those that came before us had a relationship with God, and I want to know how to get to that relationship. I want to know how to get to that altar. I believe that we must position ourselves with His will and with His plan, yes. with His word. We must set the anchor and be unmovable, yes. steadfast and sure. Yes. There has to be an altar in our lives that reminds us of our deliverance and from our past and gives us hope for our future. Yes. Our kids need to see it. Yes. Our friends need to see it. Our families need to see it. Our co-workers need to see it. They need to know that there's an altar in our lives that we humble ourselves before God at. I'm talking about an altar of repentance. I'm talking about an altar of sacrifice. I'm talking about an altar of praise and an altar of worship. We can't back up. We can't back down. We can't dilute it and we can't pollute it. We must stand on the other Peter 2 and 22 says, But it happened unto them according to the true proverb. 
that was washed in the mire. I don't want to go back to that mud hole. I don't want to go back to that vomit. I want to see it for what it is. There's one that wants to deceive us. There's one that wants to make it look like something that's not. But we must not be forgetful. We must remember what it was when we was back in Egypt. Take a look and we'll find that God brought them out with great signs and wonders that God provided for them. God split the Red Sea for them. God killed the, the, the armies of the Pharaoh for him for them. When they got over to the other side, he gave them a government. He gave them a law. He put order into their lives. He told them, this is what I want you to do, and this is what I don't want you to do. He gave them, you don't have to worry about coming up with it all by yourself. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a people. I'm going to be your king. Just obey me. Just obey my word and follow me. Don't be questioning me. Don't be, don't be trying to do it your way. Just follow after me. Exodus 16 and 4. I'm not going to read it. But it talks about God giving manna from heaven. It said, what do you brought us out here to do? Kill us. We're hungry. We need something to eat. And so God begins to provide manna for them. And the Bible says in Exodus 16 that He gave it to prove them. That He gave it to test their obedience. And He commanded them that they would partake of it every day. Yes. And I can't help but look at manna as the bread from heaven. Because that's what it was. And I relate that to the Word because it's the bread. And it's from heaven. And it's the Word that feeds us. And I think that it would behoove us to, to daily partake of that Word that God has given to us. Uh, we can't take that uh, just for today and stock up for today for tomorrow. That's right. That's good, brother. Oh. We can't just get enough at one time to last all week. That's it. That's it. we got to get some every day. we got to go out there every day and find out, God, what do you want from me today? God, what's your Word for me today? What's your instructions for me today? If we'll get it every day, we'll get it in our hearts. If we'll get it every day, Because we got a daily diet of it. But when we read on in Numbers 11, you find out that the people began to murmur and the people began to complain. And God got upset about it. And He sent a fire amongst the camp. And He said that it burned out those that were on the uttermost part of the camp. And when you really get to study that word uttermost, it says those that were the furthest out. It's dangerous when we start getting away from God. The further we get away from God, the more we're going to desire the flesh. The further we get away from God, the more we're going to be looking back at Egypt. we got to get as close to God as we can. we got to stay close to the tabernacle. we got to stay close. The priests would never get up into the Holy of Holies. That was as close as they could possibly get. But I want to get as close as I can to that holy place. Sweeter. 
This is too hard. There's got to be something with a little more meat on it. I want the flesh. And so the Bible tells us that God in His anger, He says, I tell you what, you want flesh? I'll give you all the flesh you can handle. I won't just give you one day. I won't just give you two days or five days or a week. I'm going to give you a whole month of it until it comes out your nostrils. I'm going to give you so much flesh you can't stand it no more. And then Moses says, God, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? We can't give these here people flesh for an entire month. We can't do that when we take all the herd that we have to feed them. When we take everything that the church stands for so that they can have the desires of their flesh. When we take everything that we build up and give it away so they can have the lust of their flesh. Is that what we're going to do, God? Are we going to give it all away? Are we going to surrender it all? And God says, my hand is not short. I will accomplish my word, Moses. You just wait and see. Don't you worry about how I'm going to do it. We're not going to mess up the church. We're not going to give away what I build up. I've got a plan, and we're going to teach them. Don't you worry. I have a stand, and it's going to happen. These people are going to cross over into the promised land. There's a church, and that church is going to be found without spot and without wrinkle. We're going to make it.
presence of God. They couldn't recognize the danger of that wall of flesh that was around them. We've got to recognize the flesh when we see it. And we've got to see it for what it is. It's the vomit of the dog and it's the water of the sow. And we've got to leave that stuff alone. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. No idea where I'm at. has given us His Word. And He desires us to partake of the daily and to be obedient to it. Oh, that God would keep a passion and a fire burning inside of us for the truth. That we would build an altar that will not be forgotten. An altar that will be remembered. I don't know who coined this saying where I heard it Perhaps I've modified it. I don't know. I Googled it and it didn't come up. I've heard it somewhere. I don't know, but hear me today. If you want to be great, find someone who is or was great and do what they're doing. Copy what works. Now before anyone gets carried away, let me help you with this. Let me remind you of some of those examples. Noah built an altar. Abraham built an altar. Moses, he built an altar too. Joshua built an altar. Gideon built an altar. Samuel built an altar. I'm talking about men of God mightily used of God. Men who paved the way. Who blazed the path, not by their strength, by their power, or by their wisdom, but by God's. And they met Him regularly at an altar. I'm not talking about an idol. I'm not talking about an image. And I sure ain't talking about the kind of altar that Aaron built while Moses was up receiving the commandments. To some God made by hands of man. Or the altars that was built to pagan gods that was put up on high places. That's not the kind of altar that I'm talking about tonight. What I'm talking about is a place of remembrance. A place consecrated to God. A place where we can humble ourselves before Him and say, God, it's about you and your will and not about me and mine. I've got to have an altar. I've got to have an altar. I've got to have a place where I can go, where I can hear from God. A place where I can lay my sins upon that altar and say, God, bring it out of me. Remove this to flesh so that your spirit can have its way. Give me understanding. Give me authority and power. God, I gotta have an altar. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to go back. I still remember how bad it was. I still remember that bondage. I still remember it, and I don't want to go back. We've got to take a stand. If we've got to take a stand, and I believe we do, then we might as well take that stand here. And now, right here and right now, is the best place to draw the line in the sand and say, I'm going to take my stand against the things of this world. I'm going to take a stand against the flesh. I'm going to take a stand against what's popular. I'm going to take a stand on God's Word. I've heard it. You've heard it. People are saying, times are changing, preacher. Stand. The Bible's outdated, preacher. Stand. Doctrines and standards 